Hello, ever hello everyone. I just want to welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, we're going to be talking about the three roles an, an executive pastor can't delegate. And uh, today, our focus is going to be on you, executive pastors. And I think there's some people that are just buying today to see what executive pastors should be focused on. So I know we have a lot of senior pastors and leaders in other roles too looking in today. Welcome. It's good to have you with us. Uh, when the executive pastor role, role is working right, the results can be pretty predictable. Um, and when it's not working, vision stalls out, staff teams can get dysfunctional, tension can develop in relationships with the, the senior and lead pastors. But in today's conversation, we're aiming to help you get greater clarity on what this essential role should do in the church and give you a framework for evaluating uh, so that you can get results and uh, really get more done through others. So uh, today I'm joined by three people that have sat, they've just, they've been in this executive pastor role, beginning with Paul Alexander. Paul, say hello to everybody. Hey guys, glad to be able to join you. Paul is the executive pastor at Sun Valley Community Church in the Phoenix area, and uh, Sun Valley has uh, five, five, six locations now, Paul, is it five locations? Uh, yeah, se six, several yeah. thousand people gather for worship every week. Uh, Paul also happens to be on the team at the Unstuck Group, and it's good to have you in today's conversation, Paul. Also with us is Jenny Katrin. Uh, Jenny is the founder of Foresight Group. Uh, previously, in her previous life, she was also an executive leader, both at Menlo Church in, uh, in California and then also at Cross Point Church in the Nashville area. And Jenny, welcome, good to have you with us. Glad to be with you guys. And then finally, last but not least, Dan, uh, Dan Ryland is joining us. Dan currently is the executive pastor at 12 Stone Church here in the Atlanta area, but previously was the executive pastor by a guy by the name of John Maxwell. Uh, and Dan, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if I heard the title executive pastor before you had that title. So there were probably other executive pastors around before you, uh, but you're, you're one of the pioneers of the role. So it's really good to have you in today's conversation. I think that's the nicest way anybody's ever told me I'm old. <laughs> but, uh, I, I do think I've actually read some articles and things that I was in the first pioneer group way back. And, um, in the Jurassic era, but uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to still be here. Well, we're glad to have you here and looking forward to your insights on today's conversation. And we really do intend for this to be a conversation. In fact, if you would like to participate, there's a chat feature at the bottom of your screen and Sean from our team will be helping with the chat. He'll be responding to questions and we're going to be grabbing some of your questions for the end of our conversation this afternoon so that if we don't hit specific topics, we can answer your questions. Or if you want us to elaborate a little bit further on, this, uh, on the topics we're talking about this afternoon, we'll do that as well. Also, if you want to participate uh, in social media, you can feel free on Twitter, Facebook, use hashtag UnstuckChurch. So let's, with that introduction, let's just dive into the conversation. As I mentioned, we're going to be looking at these three roles that executive pastors should not be delegating. And the first one I want to highlight is owning the responsibility for closing the gap between vision and execution. So we're looking at how do we make that vision actionable. And Paul, I'd like to begin with you. Uh, clarifying and casting vision really isn't enough. Eventually, you need to define how the vision will be accomplished and then execute an action plan to see it through. So can you describe the role that executive pastors have in helping vision become reality? Yeah, sure, Tony. I think there is a really big gap between a, a big dream or a vision and what's actually really happening in, in the church. And what fills that gap between vision and reality is this thing called strategy. And while vision may answer the question, where are we going next? Uh, strategy answers for everybody in the organization within the church, how are we actually gonna do that? How are we actually gonna go there 
and get those things done so that dream becomes a reality. And just like, just like the senior pastor, there's things that they can't delegate away from their responsibilities and their role, like vision, where the church is going. The executive pastor cannot delegate strategy away from their role. It's their job to provide organizational alignment uh, and help the whole animal move towards accomplishing that vision. Yeah, Paul, can you give some specific examples of how you do that, how you move the strategy forward? I mean, one might be in a recent podcast, you and I were talking about a leadership development strategy. So either elaborate on how you and your role do that, or maybe pick another uh, strategy focus area just to help us understand what that looks like. Yeah, so one of our strategies for expansion and reaching new people for Jesus is multi-site. And so uh, while that vision of reaching new people in new places rests and resides with the senior pastor, he's doing the vision casting part of that. He's building the public ethos and getting the church on board, kind of pointing the direction. What then falls to me is then how do I align all the pieces of the business function of the church, the staffing function of the church, the site procurement, um, funding, now adding the ministries, what ministries come first that first year, the second year, um, it, if you think if the senior pastor had to think about where we're going and reaching new people in a new location, and he had to carry the weight of all those other details and the strategy execution side of things, that job would be overwhelming for anybody. I'm not sure Jesus mm -hmm. could do that job. I think he could, but you're right. For the rest of us, it would be challenging. Uh, Jenny, what, what, what happens if that how that Paul mentioned is not defined? So it's not enough just to have the vision and then the strategy, but we need to know how we're going to execute the strategy. Do you, and yeah. do you have any examples that you could share? And how do you lead through that? Yeah, yeah. And this one, I feel like is a uh, is a really important one for executive pastors to find the right balance to because you know I think sometimes I, what I see I've seen in myself and I see with a lot of leaders is in some cases we can be too detailed in the how like like micromanaging every nuance so that our team doesn't feel empowered to help bring their ideas and perspective or we can completely kind of abdicate any direction and then we're off, you know, all of a sudden the team are bringing things back and it's not in alignment with what the vision was or what we hope to accomplish. And so I think one of the first things we have to figure out as a leader is, you know, where do I naturally land? Am I one who's more, in, uh, more inclined to be a little micromanagey because I'm, I'm so particular about every piece? Or do I kind of, and I, I can sometimes be guilty of this, I deeply believe in my team and I'm like, oh yeah, go do it, make it happen. And all of a sudden I haven't given enough of kind of those guardrails for how we want to implement, you know, whatever the strategy piece is. And then they're kind of off course and I'm frustrated, they're frustrated. Then I do feel like I'm zooming, you know, sweeping in and being a micromanager again. So mm -hmm. I think this is really important for us as executive pastors to kind of grasp where do I land on that continuum? And, and, and in fact, what does my team need right now? So I think in, in defining what is needed in how we accomplish, you know, how we lead through things, uh, we need to be aware of, is this a brand new initiative? And so I do actually need to give a little bit more specifics to how, because it's mm -hmm. new to all of us. And so the vision is, you know, myself and the lead pastor are probably a little more tied to that vision. Um, or is this something that, you know, we've got, we've got more reps, we've done this more, the team know what we're what we're shooting for. And so I don't have to give quite as much detail. So that's been a big piece for me is the, the awareness of what level of detail is needed in, in informing how to carry out a project. Um, I had one of the stories, um, kind of an example of this for me with my team um, at the church in Nashville was again, I, it was a season where I was probably a little bit too instructional giving too many details. And the team came back to me and they said, Jen, we really need you to tell us what and why. Like, we need you to give us really clearly the vision. We need you to tell us what it is you're looking for, be incredibly clear about that expected outcome, but then release the how to us. Like, you know, they were saying, we need some freedom because otherwise you start to become the bottleneck in your organization. And so they said, we need you to be super clear about what we're doing and why we're doing it, but then give us some latitude. But along with that, I had to also be clear about, are there some guiding principles, some values that I want them to have in determining how they're going to accomplish that vision? So 
that's, I think sometimes when we're trying to describe, you know, we're trying to define that how, it might not always be the specific tactics, but it might be the clarity of what, and then it might be guiding principles or values that help them make more decisions about how to implement, if that makes sense. That's very good, yeah. Dan, uh, you have the opportunity, you've worked for a great vision caster in the past and you work, work for one now. How does, how does your pastor set you up for success in your role in helping you allow that vision to become reality? Yeah, Tony, uh, Kevin is a, a great vision caster for sure. But one of the advantages is he's, he's also a, a great big picture strategist. Maybe not, he, he's a, he has good instincts and an intuition on bigger strategy. So that helps. But th what does he do to, to help that? Um, one, I think he, not I think, he seeks my input before he goes public. And that really helps. He allows me to, to shape it. And along with the board and other key leaders, of course. And, and then like Jenny was saying, um, uh, he makes the what really clear, but releases the how. I'll give you a quick story. Actually, it's not a quick one, but I'll make it quick here. Uh, several <laughs> years back when we launched five campuses on one Sunday, which by the way, don't do that. Uh, uh, all, I, <laughs> although I can report the quintuplets, to, uh, the quintuplets as we affectionately call them, they're all fine and you know, they all have their own buildings now except one and, and so that's going well. But on the what and the how, I remember going back and forth. Remember I said he lets me have input and I was just near begging, you know, let's, can we, we'll launch one a, one a week, we'll launch one a month, we'll launch, you know, but not, not five on a day. And, and, but he made that, that strategic piece, the big strategic piece clear no, we're going to do, and it was really a God call, a good call, it was the right thing. We did them all in on one day, so that that was part of the what. But then the how, which is was massive, how you how you do that from there, that uh -huh. was all up to us, and of course a, a, an executive team. And and from there, he really did let go and let us let us have at it. Um, the last thing that comes to mind is that. Uh, Kevin really puts his head deep in the game before he steps out. For, for him, it's never like a bunch of pizza and, you know, last night and he just came up with a new, you know, he's, he, he goes deep in it. It's not idea of the week and, and thinks it through really well before he steps out and empowers. Yeah. That's very good. Um, all right, so that's the, that's the first role as executive pastors that can't be delegated. It's, it's really making, that, making sure that action plan is aligned for closing the gap between vision and execution because we do, we want the vision to become reality. The second role, key role that an executive pastor can't delegate is leading high impact teams. And the key thought here is that executive pastors really do have to own the responsibility for both building and then leading a staff team that embraces health and performance. And Jenny, on this question, I'd like to begin with you. Um, because the senior pastor is so heavenly invested, invested in the roles that he or she can't delegate, it takes another strong leader in a church organization to build uh, and lead the team itself. So mm -hmm. how do you develop and uh, create this trust and increase influence with the staff when it's actually most oftentimes the senior pastor that's more visible with the yeah. staff? I mean, they're the person yeah. that's teaching every Sunday. They're the person that's vision casting. So the staff sees that person as the leader, but in reality, uh, especially as churches grow, this, the executive pastor has to take on that leadership role with the staff team. So how do yeah. you do that? Yeah, it's such a good question because it is a little bit of a, like a tricky dichotomy there uh, that you know, the, the lead pastor is typically more visible um, and his voice carries the greatest influence and, and rightly so. Uh, but as the executive pastor, that development of the team is super critical. And I think the, the, one of the key like perspective shifts we have to make as a executive pastor is to recognize that that is some of our, that is our, one of our primary responsibilities. It's actually the development and care of the team. The senior pastor is going to care about that. That's important to them, but it's not something they're going to be able to devote a ton of time and energy to. And so I think it's really important as the exec pastor 
to just recognize that that's a primary part of your role. And, you know, as far as that earning influence thing, because it does feel it can get a little clunky because the senior pastor walks by and has an idea or a thought and says that to a team member and it carries disproportionate weight. And they may not know that you've actually been coaching something different and then you're having to go back and, you know, and so you're all smiling because we've all faced that. Um, but I think, you know, getting comfortable with the fact that over time as the executive pastor, when you're intentionally developing your team and they know that, you know, in, in the ins and outs, the highs and lows, you're going to be the person who's constantly there coaching them, developing them, investing in them. The senior pastor cares and he, he or she's going to have episodic influence in that. But um, as the executive pastor, you, you consistently can be that voice. And ultimately, that helps you earn that trust and have that influence that is going to give you the credibility in that space. So I think you just have to kind of recognize all those dynamics and then really own that that's a big, big part of your responsibility as um, the executive pastor and, and, just, and just really committing to developing your team and earning, you'll earn their trust that way. It takes time uh, when you're especially yeah. in, new in the role of executive pastor or the executive pastor role is new to your church. Any, any wisdom, Jenny, for those that are experiencing either one of those situations at their church right now? Yeah, yeah. And I remember very specifically when I stepped into one of my, my roles um, that uh, it, it, and when it was a season where previously the team was pretty small. We had just introduced the executive, uh, executive director was our title, but um, we had introduced that role to the organization and previously everybody had reported to the senior pastor. So now they're getting mm -hmm. redirected to me. I'm in this new role that hasn't existed before. And, uh, and so everybody's behavior was to default back to talking to the lead pastor. And so we were, you know, we're trying to constantly coach and redirect that behavior. But there were, honestly, there were a lot of really key conversations with me and the lead pastor to, for me to help identify when sometimes he was unintentionally kind of perpetuating the old system. And so there are, there, for me, there were places where in, in, you know, first I had to just build relationships and earn, my, earn trust and be patient with the process of earning the influence. So I've got to pay, make sure I'm being patient with that. But then there were some points where I had to, to talk with the lead pastor to say, hey, you know, we're, we still haven't quite shifted some of this. And so here's where you could help me. You know, when they come to you to solve this, just ask them if they've checked with Jenny yet. And, and so anywhere where you can redirect, and that can be touchy. So you've got to make sure that you're coming with a posture of you're really there. It's not because you're insecure or whatever. You're there because you want to help the organization succeed in this new structure. So the, the conversations with my lead pastor were really critical in that process as well. Just a side note, that's a great parenting tip too, because <laughs> believe it or not, kids will play parents off each other. Yeah, they will. So it's just, <laughs> so thank yep. you, Jenny, for offering that as well. <laughs> that's awesome. Just saying I've lived by experience, that's all. Uh, all right, uh, Dan, we talk a lot at the Unstuck Group about both the health and the performance of teams. Both are critical, especially in the church. Uh, we want the church to accomplish a, a great mission, and we want the church to have a team that's healthy when they do that. So in large growing churches, which side of that equation do you think tends to get most neglected, and how would you encourage other exact executive pastors to help overcome that tendency? Uh, Tony, I think that's an important question. And in the churches that I'm in um, around the country, uh, I, I actually, I see both sides. It's potential for both sides to be neglected. Either side can be neglected, depending sometimes on the culture of the staff or the circumstances of the church or where the church is in their life cycle kind of thing. But I would say that pri primarily because of speed and pressure, um, the health side of, of the organization tends to get neglected a little bit more but I want to be quick to say, not because people stop caring, not because they don't, they don't care anymore, but because the larger you get, the more difficult it is to keep a pulse on it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much, much easier to measure performance than it is health. I mean, subjectively you can, intuitively you can, but again, when the organization is larger, it's easy to get it, you know, squishy around, you know, it's, you can't see it. 
So I, I think to, to encourage, you know, what can you do? What can we do? What, what do churches do? I think establishing uh, values, establishing cultural values, cultural behaviors that really cultivate health, that they help you monitor it, help you talk about it, help you stay in the game. I'll give you a couple of, of, of examples of things that we do that are live here, very much in the water. One is, uh, Kevin put it, Kevin established this a long time ago as the founding pastor of the church, is we call it MVP, uh, Mutual Voluntary uh, uh, Submission. Uh, MVS, I'm sorry, MVP. <laughs> MVS, Mutual, mutual uh, Voluntary Submission. Where, where, here's what it looks like. Kevin, Kevin's a senior pastor, founding pastor, clearly my boss, no question about it, he's my boss. But in 18 years, he's never treated me like he's my boss, ever. Hmm. Uh, our kind of pattern, our picture, where John Maxwell and I were always a Paul and a Timothy, Kevin and I are more of a Lewis and Clark. We kind of brought certain skills together to the mix, and we're traveling off the map together, just trying to figure this out. And, and there's just a mutual voluntary submission to each other. And that's really embraced across our staff. And that, that practice helps uh, in a big way. Another one we, we, that you would find in our, in our culture here that helps on the health side is we do something called the last 10%. You'll hear that phrase a lot, the last 10%, where most of the time the first 80, 90% of a conversation is good, but you really don't get to the heart and the trust developing kinds of things that need to be said in a healthy way to produce the health that you really need. So we actually practice saying the last 10% in a healthy way. And those, those kinds of things, um, I'll give you one more, another thing that would be in the water here, very much in the culture. There's a phrase that's just true for us is that we want more for you than from you. And, and those kinds of things, those kinds of, they can't be just like little plaques on the wall. They have to be the real deal. But if you were here and you, we, we've known each other a long time, Tony, th those things here, those are really true things here that help us monitor the health um, and, and the vibrancy of the health in the organization. Yeah, and I appreciate your insight into as far as just the size of the team and as that grows, how that can naturally become more of a challenge yeah. on the health side of that equation. And personally, I have found that to be true in my leadership um, as the number of people that I, that I am supposed to be leading and I care for grows, what I've learned is I'm able to stay on top of all the tasks and the projects that they're responsible for. Mm -hmm. But where I begin to slip is on the other side of the equation. In other words, I don't know what they're celebrating in their life. I don't know the challenges they're facing in their life. I don't yeah. know how they're trying to take their next step in the development of their leadership. Um, more importantly, I don't know how to pray for them. And those are all indicators that my span of care has gotten too big. Uh, and, I, and in those situations, like I said, I think because of the way I'm wired up, I can stay on top of the performance, but it's the other side of the equation that gets dropped. And too many times we see this not only with senior pastors, but also with executive pastors, because it's not uncommon as the church grows for the senior pastor to recognize, I can't lead the entire staff team anymore. So an executive pastor gets hired, but that unhealthy span of care was just transferred from the senior pastor to the executive pastor. So whatever seat you sit in within the organizational chart, particularly in a church, you just need to be making mindful of, do we have an appropriate span and care in place so that we can have healthy performance and health on the team as well? Dan, yeah. were you going to follow up? Yeah, just real quick. And there are things you can, besides the kind of, you know, behaviors and, and culturally shaping kinds of things, there are actually things you can do with the staff together. For example, just yesterday, you know, we were, uh, Kevin was talking about the fact that, you know, we, we pour an extensive time for prayer over the staff and we've, I mean, sorry, over, over the church. And we've had some two and three and four hour uh, prayer times where inviting the congregation to come in and they'll literally wait in line for hours to be prayed over by large prayer teams. We did that yesterday for the staff. We had a prayer gathering for a little over two hours for the entire staff and anybody who wanted to be prayed over for any reason, for anything, personal work, whatever it might be. 
and it went over two hours where the staff, and it was just a warm, just really cool thing where they were prayed over and, and it was intimate and close and connected. But there are things we can do like that that we don't always think of because we're the ones praying for everybody else. But it was good to stop and say, you know, our team needs to be prayed over. And it was, it was powerful. That's great. All right, Paul, let me uh, turn to you then uh, for the final question on this particular topic. It seems like there's a danger for someone in this executive pastor role that there could be an unintended barrier that gets created between the senior pastor and the rest of the staff when somebody steps into this executive pastor position. Now, I know, uh, Chad, you're senior pastor, you have a healthy staff team, so I trust that this isn't happening at Sun Valley, but how, how do we make sure it doesn't? Because uh, I would think that this could be a challenge, especially for the senior pastor, that he or she might feel disconnected from the rest of the staff because of the existence of this executive pastor role. Yeah, sure. To, you know, to your point, Tony, there was a point in time where Sun Valley and the team was at such a size where Ted and I wanted to go to lunch with the staff and go to Subway and grab a sandwich or something like that. We all sat around a table and we talked and maybe something came up and we made it as a, an organizationally directional changing decision over subs at Subway, you know? And, you know, as it's, a, it's, it's unfortunate that you couldn't find a better restaurant to go to. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Things change. I'm over sorry, time. sorry for the Subway fans that are listening. I apologize. All right, carry on. <laughs> you, you get the point. Um, but as as the team grew, um, there's naturally more distance created between Chad and those kinds of conversations where he could just be with the team, hear their voice, hear their heart, and maybe even more importantly, vice versa. Um, and what I've learned over time, and you know, uh, learnings are things you pick up that you should have known ahead of time, I guess, uh, that distance actually doesn't make the heart grow fonder. Uh, distance actually makes the heart wander a little bit. And when there's gaps in relational distance, those are oftentimes more often than not filled with distrust instead of trust. We begin to be suspect of people's decisions and their motives. And we begin to think uh, and fill in the gaps. When we don't hear the story directly from the person, we begin to fill in uh, of those little stories ourselves. And so we've got to be very intentional to try to create access with Chad and the rest of the team. And we do this lots of different ways where I focus more on leading the team, providing direction. Um, we try to help our staff understand that Chad's their pastor, even though they may be in a different location, um, that uh, he loves them, cares for them deeply, prays for them often. Um, we do this through, we'll go and we'll grab lunch with different teams on different campuses and we'll sit around and we'll still, Hey, whatever you want to ask, nothing's off limits. Now it takes time, but, uh, to Dan's point, health takes time. Um, mm -hmm. your friendship with Jesus doesn't happen in a hurry. And so, um, your, your friendship with your team doesn't happen in a hurry either. So simple things like literally scheduling in time to go have lunch with a, a team on a particular campus and just provide a little bit of access to have conversations. Once a month, we have an all staff gathering where uh, Chad's providing not just direction, not just leadership, but he's pastoring the staff. Um, I help try to keep him uh, informed of, you know, what are the decisions we're making that are affecting everybody but also what are the one-off situations where we have a, a team member and they have somebody that they love deeply in their family who's in the hospital or, and Chad's not going to go to every hospital visit, but when it comes to our staff, uh, we're going to treat our staff a little bit different. They're going to get a little more access to Chad than the rest of the church is going to get. Um, so I, that, it's a little bit of a two-way street, Tony. Part of it is how I can help with that from a scheduling standpoint um, and scheduling a value into our organizational rhythm. But part of that is, Chad actually cares about the team. Um, mm -hmm. You know, his heart is not just for plowing forward and reaching more people with the gospel. And that, that's a truth, but he cares about how our team's actually doing and, and what's going on in their lives. Very good. All right. Let's jump to this third role then. This is the third role that executive pastors can't delegate. And it's all about driving core initiatives. 
So the key thought here is that executive pastors have to own the responsibility for driving these core initiatives in order to free the senior pastors to focus on only the roles that they can be uh, responsible for. And we've talked about some of those roles for senior pastors in the past on previous podcasts, as an example, being the vision caster, being their spiritual leader, the primary teacher, uh, uh, being the champion of culture. Uh, being the leader of leaders within the organization. These are roles, especially in larger churches, that senior pastors can't delegate. But in order for them to live out their role, that means one of the roles that exe executive pastors can't delegate is really driving key core initiatives for the ministry. And Dan, I want to begin with you. You've worked for a couple of incredibly gifted senior pastors, both uh, very high capacity leaders. One of them famously said, you have to give up to go up. So for a lot of high capacity senior leaders, that's easier said than done. Can you share an example uh, where you really had to work to get your pastor to give up something to free him up to do what only he could do? And what did that conversation look like? Because that doesn't sound like a fun conversation to me. Well, it, it can be a difficult conversation. You know, when I joined the team here at 12 Stone, um, actually it was Crossroads back then, 18 years ago. But um, uh, uh, it was, when I joined the team, it, the, the staff then sort of affectionately said about Kevin that he would never give the keys away. He wouldn't give the keys to anybody because it was his baby. He was the founding pastor. But I can, I can tell you today, he did give the keys away. He's never taken them back. As a matter of fact, I've tried to give them back on occasion and he doesn't want them. <laughs> and, and, uh, but we, cause we really put more energy then also into something. I think that sometimes those partnerships miss is we, the phrase we use is, is reclaim the margin. You know, when a, when a, a senior pastor uh, gives up half his job and Kevin would say he literally gave me half his job and he did without paying attention to now, what do you do with the half of the, the new margin you have? you can really lose out and the, the staff just doesn't move forward. So we put a lot of energy into, so what does he do? And, and what is the new and the fresh? And, and how does he uh, utilize that margin? By doing that, he, his calendar is so full with bigger and better things, it's easier for him to let go of, of, of stuff. And I, I would actually tease him. <laughs> laugh at him because it was it didn't take long where he didn't know what was going on and yeah. you know he would say well what what are the ministries what are we doing and i'd say you know and i would laugh at him but then the tables turned because about i don't know nine or ten years later i didn't know what was going on and yeah. he is no mercy now just like you know and and because now i'm in just the same position he's in but but honestly that was perhaps as big of a struggle for me, maybe bigger for me than it was for him. And we're both good in powers, but I remember uh, what it felt like in uh, amongst the leaders in the church when they would say, so, hey, Dan, you know, catch me in, all, in the lobby or something. So when is the student ministry, the middle school, high school ministry at such and such campus meet? And I'd go, I don't know. And, and they would have a whole litany of those questions. And it took me a long time to accept the fact that I don't know, I shouldn't know, I don't need to know, we have a super capable team. But it, I think it was as complicated for me as the long-term XP as it was for the senior pastor. Mm -hmm. Dan, uh, that's, that's such a key point. In fact, I, I was having a conversation with an executive pastor just in the last couple of weeks and we were talking about these roles that really he needs to lean into more. He needs to give more of his leadership to these roles that we're talking about today. But one of his concerns was if in order for me to do that, I'm going to have to pull out of some of what I'm responsible for currently. And then it was, you could almost see his mind processing. I'm concerned I won't have a job. There's not going to be stuff for me to do. So why, why is it important, do you think, for executive pastors, especially as the church grows, to get to the place where they don't know all the details? You know, are you asking me, Tony? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think in the same way that the, the executive team or whatever you want to call them, senior staff, 
senior pastor in particular board, you know, we want to see around the corner, we want to be able to see ahead, we want to be able to anticipate. I, I think for the executive pastor in particular, there are things like we might be more in the moment, a little bit more in the day, but but you you still have to be working in advance. You always have to be in front of the team on at least one thing, if not two or three. That's a great way to figure out if you're actually leading or just managing by asking yourself the question, what are you out in front of the team? Meaning, if you're not driving this particular thing, it's not going to happen. And that's really important, even on the more subjective things like culture. Um, a good way to say it metaphorically is, you know, what are you putting in the water that's good? And what are you trying to take out of the water that needs to be taken out of the, out of the culture? And that kind, of, that kind of thing takes a lot of very dedicated thinking, very long-term processing. And if you're in the details and messing with stuff like that, you can't rise up to that stuff that, like you've mentioned before, Paul, the, how long it takes to shape the culture. You know, if you're working on uh, culture sh shaping uh, and development and learning, uh, you know, uh, uh, raising the bar for who you're hiring, those things take a lot of effort, a lot of energy, a lot of thought, a lot of time, and you can't really do it if you're stuck in the details. That's good. Well, speaking of some of those bigger initiatives, Paul, uh, what are some examples? You mentioned one earlier, multi-site, uh, but what are some of those big core initiatives that you've had to drive in order to free up Chad, your senior pastor, to soar in his role? Yeah, one in particular, we've done this just recently. Um, you know, even with our, to Dan's language, their executive team, our senior staff, you know, they report to me. Um, it's part, much more of a partnership. I mean, we don't really I have to pull the boss card. You know, we got bigger problems, but we're leading with one another in ministry. And, um, you know, for quite some time, Chad was in those meetings. Um, and just recently this last year, we, he, uh, because Chad's a pretty sober minded fellow, uh, made a decision that, you know, it's not best for him to be in those meetings. There's time, there's times he needs to be in there, but, um, uh, he needs to be spending his time and his energy thinking about the future, thinking about building culture, thinking about vision, where he's leading the church. Uh, it's, it rests to this team to think through the execution side of that. And, uh, to be honest with you, execution conversations take energy away from Chad and anything that takes energy away from Chad and the seat he sits in actually hurts the church. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if it's taking energy away from him, it's actually taking energy away from the church. And so we want him at his very best. And so uh, one example, real tangibly, we made that shift. Um, he comes into our executive team meetings uh, about every third week. Uh, sometimes he'll jump in for a 15 minute conversation. One little thing he needs to have his voice in, uh, and we coordinate that, but that's one thing that just recently we've removed from his plate. Um, and, but it's not a taking away of something it's to Dan's point. It's a knowing who you are, knowing who you're not and doing what's best for the whole. And, uh, you know, Dan talked about the similar, the mutual submission between him and Kevin and uh, leaning into each other's areas of brilliance. And so it has more to do with that and being who God's wired you up to be and what's best for the church as it is to letting go of something that belongs to you. Um, and, you know, Sun Valley doesn't belong to either one of us. This is God's mm -hmm. church. Yeah. So, uh, you know, board leadership is an example of that. Senior staff recruiting. There's all kinds of initiatives depending on what's needed in the moment that may fall to my shoulders. Um, but I'm certainly soliciting his input and keeping him informed. So he's not leading in the dark. That's good. That's good. All right, Jenny, I want to wrap up this part of the conversation with you. And by the way, I'm sure this has never happened to you, but you've probably heard of the situation where a senior pastor is overflowing with new visions, new strategies, and they're just one conference or one book away from trying to implement something brand new in the yep. organization. You're, you're familiar with other churches that have uh, this challenge? Yeah, I've just heard of a few. That, just <laughs> okay, all right. All right, so given that's the challenge and given that one of the roles that executive pastors can't delegate is just driving these core initiatives, yep. as an executive pastor, how do, you, how do you maintain that focus when yep. many times you're working for a visionary that's dreaming bigger dreams all the time? 
Yeah, it's such a good question. And I think every executive pastor probably deals with this to some degree. And part of it is that you've got to recognize that that actually is a good thing. You know, like one of the things we need our, our senior pastors to do is to have, you know, to, to be pursuing vision. Now, you know, a new idea a day or a week is, is a little much. So, I mean, part of our responsibility as the executive <laughs> pastor is, is to be that person who is, you know, helping us stay consistent to that strategy, to those core initiatives that we've defined and recognizing that's a big part of the role that you play. I think I, I can remember kind of that aha moment where, you know, I recognized I actually do need to bring a different voice and perspective than my senior leader, right? Like that's actually the gift I bring to him and to the church is when I can be kind of that balancing, you know, piece of saying, okay, but hey, remember, you know, here's, here's a strategy we mapped out. Here's where we are. Here's what we're doing with our core initiatives. And so it's recognizing that that's the seat you sit in and, and being comfortable in owning that place and not getting exasperated when they come with a lot of ideas, but just helping kind of, you know, I think one of the things that I learned in that space was I needed to be able to come back to my senior pastor and help him see how we were actually taking great steps towards our strategy and our, the progress we were making on our initiatives so he could feel that momentum. Because I think a lot of times for visionary idea guys, they just, they love the energy of new and feeling the momentum of new. So sometimes we have to remember to translate what's happening back to them so that they can, they feel that movement towards some of those bigger long-term initiatives. So I think you got to own it and recognize you live in that tension of that space. And then you've got to be able to balance it because they are going to have some ideas that they're really passionate about and want to see implemented. And if you're always the wet blanket on it, um, that's going to end up becoming frustrating. So I always said I was kind of the bridge between reality and possibility, that my senior pastor was, you know, the possibilities guy and my team were the ones living in the reality of what's it going to take. And I had to be the translator between those two places, which can be a little tiring. But again, you've got to own it and recognize this is, this is, this is the role I play. So how can I help translate to my senior pastor? Hey, that idea is awesome. I love it. Um, here's what that would take for the team. So let me tell you how or when I think we could do that. And I found that when I would come back with not just a no, that's a bad idea or we can't do it, but I would come back with, well, here's how, you know, here's what it would take for the team to be able to implement that. But it would be at the exchange of this other thing that five weeks ago was a priority and, you know, just kind of helping reset. And so they, they would kind of see the consequence of if we implement a brand new idea, because that's really exciting today, it's at the expense of this core initiative that when we, you know, sat down and built our strategic plan, we said this was key to us this year. Um, so anywhere where you can just try to bring perspective and, um, and really help your, your senior pastor kind of understand if they have a new big idea that they're thinking they want to implement, if I can help him see the whole, the whole picture of what that's going to mean, both for the team and for, you know, to, to the strategy we've already set. Um, typically that would help kind of right size it a little bit, but, um, yeah, just, just that, that recognition that that's a big part of where you live and you've got to help kind of be that bridge between, between those two things. You might've just shared the most important thing that we could have covered on this webinar. And that's if you're an executive pastor, don't always be a wet blanket for your senior pastor's dreams and ideas. Yeah. That's, I that's mean, how you, that's deal. how you. It really is. It really is. We, it would have been a much shorter webinar if we just had that one point, though. So uh, th thank you for all your thoughts on that. We're just about ready to jump into live Q&A. Uh, before we do that, though, you've been hearing about these things that are pretty important in the health of any church, making vision actionable, um, building high-impact teams, driving core ministry initiatives. I mean, these are, these are critical functions in any church. And uh, as, a, as it relates to all three of those areas, we've been working on something behind the scenes at the Unstuck Group. Actually, you're hearing about it first today because we don't even have anything on our website about it yet. Um, it's, we're calling it Unstuck Teams. And for the last year, we've been developing a whole new process to help teams get healthier and accomplish more. And we're going to be rolling this out in the beginning of 2020. Uh, Lance Wick joined our team this past year. Lance is a great, great pastor, great leader. 
and has been so helpful helping churches across the country through the years deal both with soul care and health of the team, but also with performance and accomplishing a great mission. And he's helped us design a completely new process. I'm excited about it because for the first 10 years of the Unstuck Group, we've been focusing on the overall health of the church. And now we're gonna be able to offer something to your churches to help your team get healthy and for it to be high performing as well. Uh, you can learn more about that uh, by jumping on our website in the coming weeks. Uh, but if you want to have a, one of the first conversations we're having with churches about potentially bringing that process to your church, you can go to theunstuckgroup.com slash start, and there's a form to fill out, and we'd love to begin a conversation with you about unstuck teens. All right, here we go. This is the great, this is my, the fun part, because I get to pick out the toughest questions and select who's going to answer them. So this, this is fun for me. Um, uh, Sean, I'm going in order. He, he has questions highlighted in yellow for me. I think that means these are the good questions. So we'll see what he has for us. Uh, Paul, I think this first question though, I wanna give to you, how much responsibility do you put on the executive pastor to help the senior pastor develop the vision and keep it at the forefront especially in environments where the vision isn't well developed currently? Well, a lot of it depends. Okay. So I'm going to give just straight up my input, my opinion, because that's what you've asked for. Um, a lot of it depends on the personalities in play and the relational trust between the senior pastor and the executive pastor, frankly, sometimes yeah. it may be necessary to bring in an outside organization to help bring a little clarity to you know, where are we? How do we get where we are? And where do we believe God wants us to go? And how do we actually start taking steps to do that? That's one of the things we do at the Unstuck Group. Um, so sometimes you need a little help from the outside and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I, I think it starts foundationally with the trust and the relationship between the executive and senior pastor. If the senior pastor is asking for that and it treats you as a partner, then participate fully in the partnership. Um, if you have the opportunity to lead up, and uh, ask some good questions, uh, ask some good questions and lead up well. Uh, do so with great respect and authority. God's put that uh, person in that seat, not you. And uh, so I think we need to honor what the Lord's done and the Lord's person in that seat. But uh, your job is to help that church be as successful as possible and helping the most amount of people meet Jesus and follow Jesus. So uh, don't shy away from those conversations either because eternity really is at stake at what we're doing. We're not building a business. This is the, the body of Christ. So mm -hmm. um, don't be afraid of those conversations. Yeah, that's good. Uh, ask good questions, not leading questions. I think that's yes. sometimes where executive pastors get themselves in trouble is they are asking questions that they know they want the answer to be a certain answer. Uh, but asking good questions is a better way to approach that. Mm -hmm. uh, related to that, Dan, I'll give this one to you. How do we foster the relationship between a senior pastor and an executive pastor? Any practical wisdom you can offer there? Uh, I think that you have to have a commitment, a, a, a discipline and a commitment to meeting regularly. Uh, for, for of the 18 years that we, Kevin and I have partnered, for 15 years, we met every week on Tuesday for two and a half hours, and we just never missed. We, we never missed. And it was only in the last three years that we've gone to twice a month because the organization, the church became, the staff became so large that just the two of us was too small, and we became the bottleneck. Um, and we often measure, um, it's a very important measurement to us is, is there have been seasons when Kevin and I were clearly the bottleneck and our job is to not be the bottleneck and make sure the staff can run as fast as, and what that means, what we mean by bottleneck is if they're waiting on us for decisions, if they can't go do what they've got to do because they're waiting on us because we can't get to it because our plate's too full. And so uh, we didn't, there was no margin left. We certainly couldn't add more meetings when I said, you know, Kevin, we need to build an executive team or Paul, you mentioned a senior team. And so we built that, but there was no space for more meetings. We couldn't just cram more meetings in. So I said, Kevin, you and I are gonna to need to give up two of our four meetings and we'll take those two spots and we'll, and we'll put the senior team in there. And we've been doing that for the last three years or something, which has been really, really good. But I think still though, uh, we just had our meeting yesterday 
today Wednesday? Yeah, yesterday, it was yesterday. <laughs> and it was the two and a half hours, very open, last 10%, very candid. Of course, this far into the relationship with trust as high as it is, we can travel quickly. We always take time for personal things. We check in on how each other are doing. But you, you can't overvalue trust. You can't overvalue honesty. You can't overvalue uh, uh, cards on the table. Um, everything, you know, short accounts. Um, we're fortunate in this way, uh, Tony, that Kevin and I, even though our, our personalities are really different, you know, he's motorcycles and speed and I'm fine guitars and music, you know, and so we're really different. But when it comes to leadership and strategy and ministry, we think scary alike and mm -hmm. that helps. So uh, I'll, I'll close it off with this. Uh, the longer you are together, not, it's not as important to learn so much what what your what the partner thinks the person you're working with but how they think is mm -hmm. really important and i would say kevin knows how i think and i know i know how he thinks that's good all right this is a really specific question jenny i'll let you have a first crack on it but i might want to get opinions of others too and it's about uh when should a church consider hiring an executive pastor are there are there some attendance numbers that we should consider? Are there other factors that we should consider? What are, you, what are your thoughts on when a church should consider hiring an executive pastor? Yeah, that's a great, I mean, it's a great question. And it's a little bit of a, it's kind of a moving target, depending on a few factors. I think a lot has to do with what the strengths of the lead pastor are. Um, hmm. And and I think every executive pastor role, I think, you know, even some of the comments I've seen in the in the chat, you know, there's so many variables in what the function of the executive pastor is in general, because it's very much nuanced to complement the senior pastor, in my opinion, that mm -hmm. the best executive pastors know how to be that complement to the senior pastor's skill set. Um, and then the size of the church and things influence that. Now, my, my personal experience, um, the, when, I came, when I started as an executive director, I, and it was a new role to the church that I was a part of in Nashville, I came on staff when the church was about 500, but it was on a pretty fast growth trajectory. So it was anticipation of us getting to 1,000 rather quickly. So I think somewhere in the 500 to 1,000 range is when you need to be, when you really need to be considering an executive pastor. And the, you know, the growth trajectory, the size of the team, a few different variables kind of impact that. That's typically when I see the need emerging and then, um, you know, usually once you've eclipsed a thousand, it's getting that it, it becomes more glaringly obvious in my experience. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, let me, uh, Paul, any thoughts on that? Any additional thoughts? Uh, I was just going to piggyback on what Jenny said. I think the word executive pastor these days means probably 10 different things to 10 different people. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I'm seeing churches being planted with a senior pastor, executive pastor partnership from the get go. And, um, uh, I'm not necessarily sh sh you put whatever label on it you want. I think it really comes down to what Jenny was getting at function. Um, how do you complement the senior pastor's gifting and personality and wiring? So, um, did that 500 to a thousand, I would, I, I would certainly affirm that. Uh, I think going back to our span of care conversation we had earlier, that absolutely factors into the win. Uh, as far as when that happens. And then you can kind of cheat a little bit and prolong the hire of an executive pastor based on how you decide to structure the staff as well. So, um, you know, you can structure to get past a thousand people without having an executive pastor and having more of a uh, team approach. Um, but uh, that's going to require a little bit more time of the senior pastor and their personality comes into play there. So it, it's not an always, it's, it's not a black and white answer. Yeah, Dan, any other thoughts from you? Yeah, real, real quick, I, I think what, what Jenny and Paul have said, have, uh, I, I agree with all of it. And so my thoughts are more additive, not, not uh, contradictory. Uh, although I typically, I typically would say, again, on a generic basis, that, that the 1,000 to 1,200 is where I start helping churches get an executive pastor. Primarily because I find that there is difficult, if I can be super practical, for them to afford one um, in the mix before that. And then what happens is uh, they, that they carry major dual roles. And, and usually, the, you know, Paul, what you're mentioning, they're so different. Like 
I, if, if we generalize and say there's two big buckets, there's one sort of the administrative executive pastor, and then the one where I, the side I'm on is more of the leadership coach, ministries executive pastor. And then when the church does get large enough for two, typically the senior pastor will ask that person, well, which one do you want? They'll almost always say, I'll take the leadership side. And they typically, in my consulting, they should have taken the other one. And it gets <laughs> really awkward. It gets really awkward. But uh, I'll just toss in a different thought here just to pull a pin on a grenade. I think an important question is uh, to ask, to, to talk about, maybe not today, but to talk about why you shouldn't have an executive <laughs> pastor. Uh, oftentimes, they'll, they'll, uh, a senior pastor will call me and we're, we're in a coaching relationship and I say, well, why do you want one? And you say, well, I just want to get rid of all the junk I don't want to do. Okay, stop. You, you know, and there are several reasons like that, being candid, that uh, a senior pastor will go for an exec and that's not a good reason. Or, or, you know, the church isn't growing. If I get an executive pastor, the church will grow. No, it won't. And so sometimes it's good to explore the reason somebody wants one, in addition to, as Jenny and Paul said, um, the function. That's, that's, that's fantastic. Um, very good. Paul, Jenny, Dan, really appreciate you joining us for today's conversation. It was great to have you. Uh, for those that are listening, I hope this has been helpful for you. Uh, some final notes here as we're wrapping up today. We will email you a link to all the resources that were mentioned in the webinar. And I've been seeing a lot of, in the chat, a lot of recommended resources too. So we'll pull those out too, to make sure that you have those. Uh, we'll also try to follow up with all the questions that we're not able to get to this afternoon during the webinar. And uh, if you do think of others, feel free to email us. You can either uh, send that to help at the unstuckgroup.com or on social media, just use hashtag unstuck church, and we'll respond to as many of your questions as possible. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, if you're interested in unstuck teams or just the general unstuck church process, uh, we want to help you move forward, help your mis uh, mission and vision move forward. And we'd love to begin a conversation with you about that. If you're interested, you can go to the unstuckgroup.com slash start. Again, thank you for joining us today. 